All right, looks like I've got to deal with what Doug was talking about before. Like, I guess I can split it up. I'll do half of the <laughs> message to you guys and then the other half to you. I don't know which is my best side to speak from. Uh, well, we are starting a brand new series this morning called This is the Life. It's based on 1 John chapter 5. If you want to, you can go ahead and flip there in your own Bibles, or I'm going to put the passages up here on the screen behind me. Uh, so you can choose whichever you would like there. But before we get into that, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to come for the next four weeks and learn what this life is all about in Christ. If you're just visiting, maybe you've flown in for the holidays, uh, I, I would suggest you look now at plane tickets uh, because the earlier you get them, the cheaper it is. <laughs> this is the life. We're, we're going through these four weeks. What is the life of a follower of Christ? This week, we're talking about being an overcomer, that we have in us the life that overcomes the darkness. Next week, we'll be talking about testifying to the truth in the world, in and among the world. The week after that, we're going to talk about what it means to pray in accordance with the will of God and pray in the power of God. And then the last week, we're going to talk about abiding in Christ in the fellowship of believers. So this week, first talking about overcoming, being an overcomer. Obviously, Christ is the great overcomer. But do you know that we can overcome as well? And it's not overcoming by us our overcoming is based on the faithfulness of God. It always has been. And so this is something that runs throughout Scripture, but especially in the letters of John here. He's talked about in chapter 2 of 1 John, as well as in chapter 4, overcoming the evil one, overcoming the false prophets, overcoming the spirit of the Antichrist. And this morning... In this morning's text, he deals with another kind of overcoming. Have you found 1 John chapter 5? It's toward the very end of your Bible. Starting in verse 1 and reading through verse 6. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood. Water meaning his baptism and blood meaning his death. Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. Will you pray with me before we move on? God, we thank you for your word. And as we walk through your word this morning, we pray that nothing would distract us from taking in the truth, God, that we would grow in you, that we would be transformed by you and become the overcomers in Christ that you have promised us we could be. For it's in his name we pray these things. Amen. So, being an overcomer in today's passage, I'm going to break that down into Basically, three things. Overcoming is tied to Christ. And I think there are three things that we see in this passage. And as we go through this passage, we're also going to go through Jesus' passion week leading up to the grave. It deals with rebirth, belief, and obedience. Now, three times 
John talks about overcoming the world. And in context, what he's dealing with is overcoming that which is opposed to God. That is how the world is defined. Not just the the trees, rocks, people in general, but that which is opposed to God. So what does it mean to be an overcomer? Well, first, I want us to focus on rebirth. We overcome with Christ. We overcome with Christ. We do it God's way. Because see, the great thing or Maybe the sad thing about the resurrection is you got to go through death to get there. To experience new life, there's got to be a death. Look at what happens in John chapter 12. This is verse 12 and 15. This is right there at the beginning of the Passion Week. This is as Jesus is entering Jerusalem. Starting in verse 12, check this out. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming seated on a donkey's colt. Now what's interesting about this happening, some of you may know this, this isn't worship of Jesus. Much different from worship. It's it's very similar to this is a reigning king coming. This is the king of Israel. He is going to release us from the shackles of the Roman government. It was national pride. We're finally going to get our nation back. We're going to get our lives back through him. The people actually at one point in time tried to make Jesus king over Israel. And so he escaped from them. Because that's not why he came. This is the kind of thing that began all the way back in 1 Samuel chapter 8. In verse 7, if you remember this event, this is when God had been leading his people through the prophets. Speaking the truth to his prophets and his prophets would share the truth with the people. Well, what happened is as the people were going into the promised land, the land that God had told them, I'm giving you this land, not because of your goodness, not because of your greatness, but because of the wickedness of those people. They would do things as unheard of as sacrificing their own children in the fire to their false gods. Now, if you're a parent, I don't know if you can even imagine that. That's, that's unconscionable to me, to sacrifice your own children in the fire, your beautiful baby girls, your baby boys, you know. And yet this is what these people would do. They had turned away from the one true God. And so they were being judged through the people Israel. But what Israel did as they entered the promised land They asked Moses, we want a king like the nations that we're going in to dispossess. Now, now think about that for a second. You're going in to dispossess people who are being judged because of their godlessness. And you're wanting to be like them. There's a problem there. But what does God say to Samuel? 1 Samuel 8 verse 7 Do what they've asked you to do. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me as their king. And so it's gone from the very beginning. A few short chapters later, after this triumphal entry, uh, John 15, 18, Jesus tells his disciples, the world hates me. And you know what? 
If you follow me, they're going to hate you too. Be ready for that. He says in John 16, that in this world, you're going to have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. He is an overcomer. And so that kind of sets the groundwork for then in John 19, when John conveys to us how the people came to Jesus' trial. And where they had been saying, Hosanna, make this man king over Israel. Now they're saying, crucify him. Crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. Now, why would there be a switch like that? Well, it gets back to idolatry. Look at how John ends his letter, 1 John 5.21. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. John was confronting an attitude in his day where Jesus became the Christ at his baptism, but the Christ, the Messiah, left him before he died on the cross. Well, that takes away what his sacrifice means for us, that it covers our sin. And it's kind of like in this video that I'll ask Jenna to play. It's kind of like when we try to do things on our own minds, what we see is Satan puts up these ideas of, oh, well, well, this is what God is like. And, and then as Satan does, he pokes holes in it. Oh, I'm going to shoot that down. Oh, that's, that's not real. Look at what he did in the garden with Adam and Eve. Did God really say this? Really? Think about what you're able to do. You can do all of these things. And so they set up a God in their own image. Okay, maybe, maybe I understand better than what God said. And Satan does the same thing today through the people of the world and through the philosophies of this world. He sets up these caricatures of God. They're not real. All of these false gods of other nations. And yet all of scripture points us to the one true God. And that all others are false. And scripture shoots down these false gods and says, hold to me. Don't make a God in your own image. And so, from the beginning of time until now, we choose man's way over God's way. We would rather have slavery in Egypt than freedom under the just and loving government of God. We would rather live in shackles than in the freedom that God has for us. Romans 5, 6 says that we were weak. When we were weak, Christ died for the ungodly. That's all of us. And you know, when Christ died, it destroyed his disciples. Why? Because they didn't get it. And we still don't get it today. Because to us, servanthood doesn't look like freedom. Suffering doesn't look like joy. And death just sure doesn't look like life to us. But it is. It is. The way to life is death to self. Look at what Jesus says in Luke chapter 9. Verses 22 through 24. And he, Jesus, said, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. 
Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. Life looks like death in Christianity, a death to self. Hebrews 12, 2 tells us that for the joy set before him, Christ endured the cross. He scorned its shame, and then he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Joy, what does that mean? Well, we read some of that this morning in the sunrise service. Isaiah 53, 11 tells us that this joy is that even after suffering, Jesus saw life. He would be satisfied. He would bear the iniquities of many. Romans 6, 10 through 11 says that he died to sin once for all. And going back to Isaiah 53, says he justified many through that death. And so, going back to Romans 6, 10 through 11, we are dead to sin in Christ. This is the death that brings real life, lasting life. Galatians 2.20 says that we have been crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Well, listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 3. This is a passage of scripture that we may know very well. Jesus tells us that we must be born again. Looking at chapter 3, ver, uh, verse 3 first, and then skipping down to verse 6. Jesus replied, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Skipping down to verse 6. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. Now, I think this is one of these comical moments in Scripture where, where Jesus is talking with Nicodemus. He's a religious leader of the day. And Nicodemus says, well, what, what do you mean be born again? You, I mean, surely you can't go back into your mother and be born again. And I imagine this is one of those moments when Jesus had one of those double blink moments. Um, of, of course not. Of course not. Why are you seeing these things in a physical way? You're a leader of Israel, and yet you don't see the spiritual reality of all of life? No. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. What Jesus is saying there is, man, when we're born into this world, we had no choice about that. We had no choice as to who our parents were what family we were born into. But being born of the Spirit, we do have a choice there. And it looks like submission to the Spirit of God. And so that leads us to our second point, that we overcome through Christ. This is belief. John 3, again, verses 14 through 18, Jesus starts, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. Who did Christ die to save? Everyone. And yet, we have a responsibility to believe and if we don't, we stand condemned before God. Now, this example that Jesus uses, just as Moses lifted up 
the snake in the wilderness. Now, do you know about this story? Let me tell it to you really quickly. The people of Israel, when they were grumbling in the wilderness, they weren't trusting God. They were grumbling against God, grumbling against Moses. And so God sent a plague of venomous snakes into the camp. Some people were bit by these snakes, and many died. Well, they knew enough to realize, oh my gosh, this is coming on us because of our grumbling against God. Ask God to remove these things. So what, is, what does God do? God tells Moses, make a bronze snake. Put it up on a pole so that if anyone is bitten by a snake, all they have to do is look at that bronze snake. And they won't die. How ridiculous is that? Look at a snake. What kind of medical advice is this? But I think that's the point, right? It's not medical advice. What the people were struggling with was not snakes. That wasn't their biggest problem. Their biggest problem was unbelief. It was denial of who God was, that God was their leader, their king, their Lord. And he loved them. But oftentimes, we look at things like that and... We think, well, I'm, I'm going to figure this out on my own. I imagine that there were many people who got bit, and they thought, that's ridiculous. I'm not going to just look at a snake. What is that going to do? But the matter is belief. Do we believe what God is telling us? The answer is simple. Being saved is simple. But are we going to believe him and be saved? Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we go off our own minds. Well, I want to test us real quick with a pick. I want you guys all to, this is audience participation. I want you to read out loud the words in the triangles. Go ahead. Okay, great. You guys are all wrong. Now, how does that make you feel? It says, Paris in the, the spring, bird in the, the hand, once in a, a lifetime. If we are tricked that easily by something that we all saw, how easily can we be misled thinking in our own minds? God calls us to believe, and it's not a blind faith jumping off into a dark chasm where we can't see where it's going. It is reasonable to trust in the God who saves. He gave all for you and I to save us. You know what? Let's take a pause right there. Let's let someone else speak. It's kind of like this. Sometimes God is just calling for us. He just wants to get our attention, and we're not listening.
What does it take for God to get your attention? Because God is willing to do anything to get your attention. And even still, we have the choice to ignore, to not hear, to not listen. Look at Luke chapter 24. This is after Christ came back from the dead. Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 44 and reading through 48. He, Jesus again, said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. You are witnesses, he said to the disciples. He told them, believe the word. It testifies about me. Believe what you've seen. You've seen me. The resurrected Christ appeared to at least six women first. This is what's really amazing. Okay? To six women. Now, if you don't know anything about the Jewish culture, women were not particularly valued. They were seen as chattel, baby-making factories. They didn't have value, especially as witnesses. And yet, what did Christ do? He elevated the status of women in the world. Don't let people rehash that old, played-out, tired, unbiblical, untruthful view that the Bible subjugates women. It does record honestly that there was subjugation of women, but it doesn't subjugate women. Women were valued. They were the first witnesses. And as a matter of fact, the gospels make it very clear that when the women went back to the disciples and said, Christ has risen, we've seen the empty tomb, we've seen Jesus, they said, no, sorry. They didn't believe And so over the next 40 days, Jesus appeared to the disciples, two travelers on the way to Emmaus, to over 500 people at one time, the scripture says. To the Israelites back before Jesus, they were told, trust in God. And then when Christ came, they were still told, trust in God. Jew and Gentile, trust in Christ. And so that leads us to our third and final point, obedience. We overcome in Christ. John tells us in today's passage, 1 John chapter 5, that to love God is to keep his commands. And he says his his commands are not burdensome, right? This is how he puts it. Well, look at how Jesus puts it in Matthew 11, 28 through 30. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is is light. Christ has an easy yoke. Belief that Jesus is who he said he is, that Jesus did what he said he did, and that you believe why he did it. You have to go through the death to get to the resurrection. John 14, 21 Jesus says that if we love him, we will obey him. Matthew 7, throughout, he says, walk in obedience to the commands of Christ. 
Otherwise, you're kind of like a person building a house on the sand. It's not going to stand up when life gets hard. And life will get hard, Christ promised. But in Christ, we are overcomers. In Christ, we can stand up despite the difficulties that we all face. Despite sickness, despite death, despite any hardship, we can stand up. In 1 John 5, 6, 5, 6, John writes that the Spirit is the truth, and the Spirit testifies to the truth. John 16, 13 says that the Spirit will guide us into all truth. This is what Jesus says. I'm going to send you the Spirit, and he will guide you into all truth, and he will remind you of everything that I've commanded you. So, the question is, what are you and I going to do walking away from this tomb? Let's go ahead and go back to that last slide and just hold it up there for a second. What does this mean for you? Do you believe that Christ died for you? This is a historical, documented fact more supportable than any other life of ancient antiquity. Do the research. Don't be like someone who looks at the bronze snake and says, what's that going to do? I'm not going to look at that. Look to Christ. Do the work, and you will see that it is true. So this morning, I don't know where you are in your faith, if you have any kind of a faith background at all, or if you've been in the faith your entire life. Maybe you need rebirth this morning. If so, I encourage you to trust in Christ and die to your sin. Experience that new life that is available to all in Christ. Maybe, maybe God needs to give you a fresh infusion of belief, trust in him. I encourage you to do that. Maybe you need to grow in your obedience to Christ this morning. I don't know where God has you. And the fact of the matter is, only God does. And we can, we can live our whole lives putting out a face of perfection. I'm not too good at it myself. Uh, I tend to be kind of like, oh no, words are coming out. <laughs> and I share with people how fallen I am. My, my wife, luckily, she doesn't, uh, she knows that I don't have to open my mouth for that to be clear. <laughs> my imperfection is clear. And so I pray that this morning, you would do that heart work before God. That just as Moses lifted up the bronze snake so that all who looked could live, I'm holding up to you, not myself, not this church, not anyone in this church, but Jesus, the risen Christ, the Messiah. And if you look to him, and trust in him, you will be saved. So will you stand with me? We're going to sing a song of invitation like we do every week. And if you would like to make a decision this morning, now's your time to do that.